Hey everyone, what's going on? Welcome back to the APU DPT vlog. So I recently participated in a study that looked at the lower back. So this study wanted to see the influence on structure, mobility, and cognition on lumbar biomechanics for functional activity. And this study is actually conducted by our very own professor and his colleagues as well, Dr. Patterson, AKA Dr. P, who's pursuing his PhD. Oh shoot, here we go. Dr. P, PhD, my name is Justin Lee. Q intro, Lego. Hey everyone, what's going on? As you know, my name is Justin Lee, doctor of physical therapy student and fitness coach. Here you'll find videos on fitness, physical therapy, and lifestyle that helps inspire self-change. These vlogs I create for you guys so I can give you the inside look on what's happening in DPT school and also give you some advice on how to get into DPT school and how to set yourself up for success after school is done. So if any of this resonates with you, consider subscribing and hitting those notifications. So as I mentioned before, Dr. P is conducting a study on the influence of structure, mobility, and cognition on lumbar biomechanics in functional activity. The purpose of the study was to really look at why some individuals use their lower back more than other people. And as you know, when you move more or increase mobility in the lumbar spine, that leads to increased stress in the lumbar spine, which we know leads to increased pain in the lumbar spine. So I wanted to vlog about this because this study was not only super awesome, but also super extensive on how many measures and how like intricate it is. But I also wanted to really talk about the technology that we now have available in our physical therapy career and in research. So this vlog is gonna show you all the technologies that were used uh, during the research process and to gather data and also like the setup and all of that stuff. And then Dr. P himself is also going to explain about the results and kind of about what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, 54. 54. Okay. Should come in, try to maintain it. No, go back up. Should come back, try to maintain it as far as you can. So before you post your late tips? Yeah, right before it does. That's why I was asleep and I. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There you go. All right. And now move to your left a little bit. And then can you see that little controller right there? Can you push the down arrow? Until, yeah, you want this to be with my finger. Oh. <laughs> and you mark, get set, and go. Begin. Begin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be awesome. Forward bend. So, yeah, my name is Dr. Patterson, and Justin has asked me just to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing here in the lab. We had him actually come and participate in the project last week. And so I'm just going to discuss a little bit about what we saw with his movement and um, talk about the process of capturing and then analyzing some of that, some of that information. 
So if you see here on the screen, this is what we were doing uh, in the lab with him. So this is him here squatting. And uh, we're going to now take this information from this program, which is uh, called Qualysis. And you can see that we have these markers on the thigh, down here on the shank and the foot. And if we take those markers and we put it into this other program called Visual 3D, you can see that the four markers right here on his femur. Um, and now we can assign a model, so a skeleton model. And so now when he um, moves, we can see how the skeleton is moving, um, a representation of the markers that we saw in the lab. So with this information now, we can look at, up on top we have his hip range of motion on the left, hip range of motion on the right. This is looking here at the back. We have some markers on the spine, and you can look at the lower lumbar range of motion and the mid lumbar range of motion. So one of the things that's unique of this study is we actually can break the, um, the lumbar spine into two segments. So we have a lower lumbar segment and an upper lumbar segment. Most models just look at the lumbar spine as one, um, one, whole uh, one whole segment. So that's a little unique about this specific project. But as you can see here, let me back out a bit. You can see that when he moves, he's using about 100 degrees. So we start at 3 degrees, go to about 104 degrees. So he's using about 100, 101 degrees of hip motion when he's bending and lifting. So this is a squat lift. Also about 101 degrees of hip flexion range of motion on the right side. And then we can also look at how much of the lower lumbar and middle lumbar spine are contributing to that movement. So if we start here at about 11 degrees and go up to 7 or 8 degrees, so about 19 degrees of lower lumbar range of motion. And then from the middle lumbar spine, we start at 21 degrees or about is that 22 degrees and go almost to about zero, so 22 degrees of middle lumbar flexion. So the goal of the study is to look at um, what are the different variables, whether it be hip range of motion, hamstring length, uh, glute or hip extensor strength, um, lumbar extensor strength, to see if which of those determine how someone moves. And what we're looking specifically for is how much they move at their lower lumbar and middle lumbar spine, because we know that low back pain is you know, a very common injury in our patients, and we want to try to figure out, are there certain variables that predispose someone to low back pain, or are there things that we can do then to improve, like, say, hip range of motion or hamstring length that would help their movement pattern and take some of the stress or motion away from the lower, lower lumbar spine or middle lumbar spine. So from here, we take all this information. We can combine that with all the EMG data that we're getting from the uh, qualysis system, and then we'll do like an analysis of muscle act activation. That's kind of the next step from here. So the purpose of the study that we're working on right now is we want to look at why certain people use their lumbar spine more than um, other individuals. So we know that low back pain is a very common complaint. It's like the number one cause of disability in the world. Um, so we're trying to figure out ways that we can help correct movement as it relates to low back pain. And we see that um, some subjects move subjects who have low back pain tend to move at their lower lumbar spine or their lumbar spine more than subjects that don't. And so in that, we're looking to see um, what contributes to that movement pattern. Is it a lack of hip range of motion? Is it uh, tight hamstrings? Is it weakness of the hip or some kind of um, um, imbalance of the hip and lumbar extensor muscles? And so what we have found so far, and one of our hypotheses is that if someone has a limited amount of hip range of motion when they're squat lifting, um, that they're going to use more of their lumbar spine. So if you look at this graph here, this is showing that if someone has, this person right here will look at this point, they have a lot of hip flexion. They have 126 degrees when we measure it passively, and they use very little of their middle lumbar spine when they're when they're squat lifting. In fact, what they're doing, if you go up here, is they're using a lot of their hip. So they're using a big percentage of that movement is coming from their hip motion. So what we want to see is somewhere here in the middle where you, you use the hip and you don't use the lumbar spine as much when you're bending and lifting because we know that at that end range, that's where the pressure is put on the spine and we'd rather our patients use their hip that's better built for squatting and lifting as opposed to their lumbar spine, which is where the injuries occur. So, so far we're getting a nice correlation between the amount of hip range of motion and how much you use your hip 
meaning the more hip motion you have, the more you're actually going to use it in squatting. And then also we're looking, we're also seeing a nice correlation between if you have a lot of hip passive range of motion, then you use your lumbar spine less. So that will help um, sort of push the next step is trying to figure out if we can improve range of motion in these subjects if their middle lumbar or lower lumbar spine contribution to movement goes down. So in this program here, this is qualysis. And all qualysis is doing, I'll back out here a little, is we have all the markers, as you saw in Justin's video before, on um, the subject and all of the cameras are collecting information about that marker. So these four markers together uh, will give us information about um, the movement of the femur in three directions. So um, moving back and forward, side to side, and also rotation. So this program, we then take all the markers and we put it into this other program, which is called Visual 3D. And you can see here we have four markers that are these same exact markers. And then we assign the length of that femur to those markers. So now anytime that femur moves, we can track that femur over here in the um, we basically run it through uh, a pipeline or a process that says, uh, this is the femur, this is the pelvis, now measure the difference between these two bones when we flex and extend. And then it gives you an actual measurement or kinematic data for how the, the subject moves. And you can do that for any segment. So we can do that for the lower lumbar or the upper lumbar, the thoracic spine, tibia, and you can pull that information out. We can also look at how much the femur is rotating or how much the femur is going into ab, uh, ab and adduction. In this case, we're just looking at sagittal plane motion, but that's how we get from the markers that you see in the subject to actual kinematic data. Dude, wasn't that freaking awesome? Like, I mean, it took forever to put those little dots on all over my body, but it's really damn cool to have those sensors and have that technology for the, for the computer to interpret where the sensors are in space and then create this 3D model of basically what my body looked like. like that's crazy. And you can now imagine that power of having that technology to see so many more different things that now we can really interpret and gather data for. So I'm trying to get Dr. P in for an interview. Now, Dr. P, what he does is as you come in for a, as a DPT student, Dr. P is one of the first professors that you will have going into DPT school. So he teaches what we call clinical skills, but this can be also known as biomechanics. Now this class, you learn about all the biomechanics of the different joints, basically the fundamentals of how joints move, how your body moves, how muscles are integrated with all of that, and also teaches you skills like range of motion testing, manual muscle testing, and all of that. So I'm trying to get him for an interview so that I can really pick his brain on, hey, so as you see first year students or as you see the noob or the fresh uh, physical therapy students come in, what are some things that you've noticed that really help them be successful? Or what are some things that you notice that they probably should try to practice on otherwise they're gonna be unsuccessful as a DPT student? So um, I'm trying to get him in. If you guys want an interview with him or want to see a video with him, make sure you put that in the comments below. So I definitely know and, and will be way more motivated to go ask him. <laughs> All right, guys, I hope this video helped inspire some self change to motivate you to get into DPT school and inspire you to really see how cool our profession is and how much more like awesome that uh, DPT school and physical therapy is. <laughs> I love, I freaking love this profession. Anyway, you guys, change people, change people. That's why we live for change people. Stay lifting. Have a great one, you guys.